Good morning, everyone. Are you excited to find out what we are about to do? Yes. Okay. Let me say that uh, my uh, talk is entitled, Come, Let Us Reason Together, A Call for Unity and a Return to the Good. This forum is meant to help us understand the phenomenon of the use of law to stifle dissent what uh, Senator De Lima so creatively invented the term lawfare. With your kind indulgence, however, allow me to approach the topic in a non-linear fashion. I will present what I think brought us to this point where lawfare is prevalent and how we can get back to a place where this is no longer so. I will not talk about lawfare in specific cases. There are experts here in this conference who can greatly help us with the technical side of our topic. But by tracing how we as a people got here and how we must climb out of this quagmire, I will show that there is basis to believe that we can be united as a people once more. I will propose some initial steps for our people to form a consensus for nation building. What I will humbly ask all of you, however, is a great deal of patience. I know many are impatient for immediate action, but I want to make the case that all of us need to look at the long term, now more than at any time in our history, for the sake of the young and future generations. In the area of social action, allow me to shift the view from tactical gains to long-term objectives. Ibig sabihin po, ang pananaw na nais kong isulong ang iyong pangmatagalan at hindi panandali ang pananaig sa kapangyarihan. Some might reflexively say that I want to weaken this government by focusing on its wrong trajectories. To the contrary, if this government will heed the message and reverse its course, then I humbly propose that it could success successfully seize the initiative in building a just and humane nation. It will be remembered for its heroic act of brinkmanship. Nothing is ever too late for a sincere leader. But what is the basis for my view that this government is not sufficiently uniting the people considering that the president apparently enjoys a high approval rating. Allow me to lay down my premises. Looking at all the survey numbers, since 2016, there is not a single one that indicates that the president has succeeded in uniting us as a people. The numbers only tell us that we have a president who enjoys high approval from a sample population. The only possible indicator of unity around any program of government is the high approval for the war on drugs. But the respondents reject its key features. They overwhelmingly disapprove of the killings and want to see the suspects alive. They believe that the suspects did not manlaban, thereby implicitly concluding that the police units murdered drug suspects. And third, they believe that police protect the drug trade or recycle seized illegal drugs. It is therefore possible that the high approval for, for the drug war could mean simply approval for the attention being given to the problem of illegal drugs, not the campaign's methods that the respondents are also relieved at the temporary peace because the tambais and drug addicts are not on the streets, albeit temporarily. Underneath that relief is deep anxiety that they or someone they know will be EJK victims. My theory is that the 80% approval rating of the president is mainly approval of his personality traits. 
The public feel connected to him. They like his strong demeanor. They are able to discount the coarseness of his language for authenticity. But this only indicates approval for the potential of what this president can be, not approval of what he is leading the country to. Unity is about forging ahead to a specific goal for our country. To the contrary, our people disapprove of the president's pivot to China. The violent deaths that are taking place, his handling of the Taal volcano crisis, the delayed reaction against the coronavirus epidemic, and the corruption and abuse of his allies, including in their handling of publicly declared drug lords, decried drug lords. This means that there is basis to ask the president to turn to the people's sense of what is right and take his direction from there. It means that the people, you, can replace the president's divisive message with a message of unity on which we can build this nation for which our heroes died. The people must express their objection to the president's penchant for crafting policies unilaterally, unilaterally seeking neither their approval nor their consent. His approval rating does not grant him the authority to turn over our country to China, nor to the enemies of good governance. We must recognize the capacities that must be restored to rebuild our flagging democracy. We must call on the president to be one with the people and return to the Filipinos' historic ideals. Three capacities are necessary to achieve the constitutional goal of building a just and humane Filipino society. The, primac the primacy of reason, guidance from science, and an underlying belief in God. The Filipino people have historically trusted their leaders to honor these capacities, or at the very least, to leave them undisturbed. But what this president and his most vocal officials have done is attack all three. Reason is the necessary foundation for building workable social relations. It undergirds all the protective mechanisms that modern civilizations have established to prevent society from descending into anarchy. Reason allows us to establish rules on what are allowed and prohibited. Remove reason and all notions of fairness and justice disappear. Reason is the foundation of laws and of justice. The very essence of law and justice is reasonableness. It allows us to have sustainable institutions of governance. Whim and arbitrariness are its opposite. This government's publicly expressed approach to decision-making has been the opposite of reason. There might be a method to its madness. And we should best anticipate the underlying strategy behind all of its seemingly irrational moves. But what is most important to the future of this nation his is how the public reacts to non-reason, contradictory reasoning, obfuscation, and even gaslighting. In the same vein, this government has set aside science as the best guide for health policy and approaches to natural disasters. All the health controversies, whether it is the dengue vaccination issue or the coronavirus epidemic, 
as well as disaster responses or weather or climate prediction, have seen government disregard the advice of well-regarded women and men of science. Had reason been used to devise our programs and policies, sufficient budgetary support would naturally have been provided for public health emergencies, typhoons, and volcanic eruptions. Fanaticism, not reason, has been the glue with which this government has offered to hold its supporters together. This fanaticism reached its highest level when the president himself attacked the concept of the divine, the basic tenets of Christianity's creation story, and replaced the redemption offer of the historic Jesus with his offer of himself as the Philippines' last card. This government has done all this without remorse and without let up. And in the process, it is destroying the Filipino identity and the nation's soul. It would take too much time to discuss various ideas about Filipino identity. Let me just focus on how students of my generation were informed about our identity. I can remember how we were all so enthralled by Rizal, the man of reason, of science, and of God. The essays he wrote as a student advocating the equality of native Filipinos with the foreign colonizers and arguing why men should be free to decide their fate resonated deeply with our youthful idealism. His belief in science and how it could help alleviate human suffering was a story of love and great courage. How he treated his own mother's cataract and how he built a clinic and a small irrigation infrastructure in the Pitan for the community inspired our imagination. His fearless belief in a just God, a God who cannot be found in capricious institutions of power, but a God who ordained that man's destiny is to be free. That was a God that we young people could believe in. And a great many of us believed in Rizal. How the moral force he exuded could conquer physical violence. How his belief in law and its institutions, so long as they were still capable of reform, allowed him to make the supreme sacrifice of not fleeing from his trial, but of stating the truth fearlessly, regardless of the consequences. That he had not instigated a revolution by arms, but a revolution by moral regeneration through the right education. Our textbooks called him the first great Malay, embodying the best not only of Filipinos, but of the entire Malay peoples of Southeast Asia. For a long time, as long as the Rizal model was held up for us, we could imagine dying for our country. We could imagine being a Bonifacio as well. The common man's intellectual with his organizing genius among workers and farmers. We could imagine being the young Emilio Jacinto. And when I began to appreciate law, perhaps even an Apolinario Mabini. We were a church-going generation. To us, a social life without God somehow being part of it was unthinkable. There was a desire to do what was right. What was not very clear was how to, we were to deal, to deal with evil practices that had become embedded in social and government institutions. Palakasan sa appointments and promotions, kampi-kampihan, personalan instead of issues-based discussions and conflict resolution, and all forms of corruption. From the simple act of gift giving, such as the mandatory lechons for important officials, to having ninangs and ninongs for the primary purpose of creating powerful connections. 
we were also not taught how to integrate our faith with notions of doing justice, of being just, of contributing to society. Had we heeded Rizal, my generation could have invested much thought in building this country in an enlightened manner. Lesser men later eclipsed Rizal and were held up as models to succeeding generations. The arrogant, manipulative, and pretentious politician. The wealthy and sexually promiscuous celebrity. The lawbreaker tycoon. The objectified beauty queen. Common den denominators of the narrowest and lowest of our aspirations. Instead of reading the works of great minds, we invested our energies in discovering how to survive in the labyrinthine world of business and politics and how our ankans could eventually be esteemed socially and dominate economically. The contradictions between our understanding of good versus evil in society were left unresolved and this has given rise to our present moral calamities. In our church-going business, we forgot, my generation forgot, that Rizal put his faith in a God who liberates from oppression, who belongs to a more universal and inclusive group than the Spanish-controlled Roman Catholic Church of Rizal's time. He believed that man's destiny is dignity, not slavery. He believed that justice is the righteous end of all law, and so he sat suffered calumny and death for daringly calling out the colonizer's use of law to inflict injustice. In the trial of his mother, the trial of Padres Gomez, Burgos, and Zamora, and in the widespread oppression of Filipinos. Rizal knew intimately, and from what he read in the Bible and other writings, that this God was a bondage breaker. This bondage breaking God this present government has unceasingly attacked, and let me recount how. The first strike was the president's assault against the wisdom of God's creation of man. We read of God having created man in his image, giving him a status lower than, a little lower than the angels, of every human being having existed in God's mind and heart even before she was implanted in the womb. God's eyes saw my unformed body. God knit together the human being's inmost being. She has been fearfully and wonderfully made. That is why the Bible condemns any word or practice that attacks the dignity of man. The president's sound bites are full of insult and degradation. Yet scripture commands that no one is to be called worthless. For all have been made in love and wonder in the image and likeness of God. The poor have a special place in God's world, and the Bible thunderously reprehends their abuse. God consistently demands justice in society and severely denounces the powerful for oppressing the weak. This God of justice is not impressed, impressed by politicians, but marvels at the humble and faith-filled. He requires service for the least and the broken, the healing of the afflicted, the lifting of heavy burdens from bent backs. He demands that all who believe him should fight for the rights of the destitute. He requires that our voice be used to speak for the voiceless and the weak, and that we take up the cudgels for the powerless. He requires nations to tread the path of justice and righteousness. He is disgusted with false fastings and false prayers. Fasting by those who oppress and the prayers of the unjust. He will not answer prayers, he says, as long as rank injustice prevails and is tolerated. He is crystal clear about the effect of shedding innocent blood. The land itself will be cursed. Our great hero Andres Bonifacio also spoke of the God of justice in the Decalogo. All our revolts against Spain, the United States, and Marcus Martial Law were struggles for justice, born in the innate belief that it is the Filipinos' destiny to be a free people. 
It is our national birthright to be free. This was not something learned in school. Bonifacio and the Katipunan's cry for justice was untaught. Even now, the struggle for justice continues among poor communities. Our youth deeply understand that to be right is to be just. And to wield leadership without a commitment to justice is inauthentic. No one can silence our youth's cry for justice. From early childhood, a child protests that it is not fair if she's not given an equal share of things, food, or gifts. Hindi tama at malalim ang hugot ng sugat kung siya ay napagbintangan nung siya ay bata pa. Lalong-lalo na kung siya ay naparusahan kahit inusente at lalo na kung siya ay nasunturon dahil sa maliliit na pagkakamali. Masakit at malalim ang hugot kung isa sa mga kapatid ang favorite na lagi na lamang pinagbibigyan sa lahat ng bagay. Such concepts as justice, fairness, due process, presumption of innocence, proportionality of punishment, even the concept of equal protection of the laws reside deep in a young person's inner consciousness and surface without need of adult instruction. Why so, you may ask? It is because these concepts have been imprinted on her by the God of justice. This president has also attacked the redemptive stories of self-sacrifice and love that have shaped the noble side of the Filipino psyche for centuries. By attacking what Christ accomplished when he offered God's love and redemptive plan for humanity by his death and resurrection, the president has enshrined the way of violence and has negated the virtue of great self-sacrifice. He has followed this with vicious attacks on everyone who attempts to help a human rights victim, as well as the victims themselves. He has promoted dominance and destruction against the well-articulated desire of Filipinos for life and dignity. He accomplished this by tapping on the resentment that welled up from unresolved cases of injustice in our formal system. In doing so, he has awakened the darkest and most bestial part of our psyche. This government has effectively repressed the good side of the Filipinos. When this president attacks the dignity of human beings by labeling them worthless, expendable, and calling for their unjust death, he reinforces the belief that one must crush another to survive and launches the downward spiral to cruelty to the destruction of her, our humanity. This violent streak, this need to dominate, has resulted in the twisted use of legal processes as never before witnessed in this country. From such a pit, we must seek to, to redeem the Filipino heart and mind. Those who prefer to discuss justice without a notion of the divine must confront the truth that the Filipino belief in the divine is prevalent and deeply rooted. Other than an, up, an armed uprising against injustice, there is no alternative in the horizon for our nation other than finding justice in the God of justice. You cannot fight violence with more violence, nor can evil be vanquished with more evil. Money politics can only be defeated by uniting our common belief in God and elevating our sides to Him. A call to unity, not appeasement. The attack on reason, science, and God by the president has eroded the basis of our unity. The first casualty was the value of human life and dignity, leading to the orphaning of many children, sacrifices on the altar of expediency. The second casualty is the Constitution. Together with its protective structures, checks and balances, the Bill of Rights, due process. The third casualty is the hope for any integrated Filipino worldview of compassion and justice. While we desire a strong leader, Filipinos want to reconcile this strength with the values of compassion and redemption, that every person deserves a second chance is a key theme of many of our favorite movies. The repentant black sheep must find 
a warm home to welcome him. Some sectors refused to confront the president for his misdirection of the country. While they privately object to this president's attack against reason, science, and God, they mistakenly believe that appeasing him will make him reasonable, science-respecting, and open to notions of God and the good. Such an approach would have been feasible had this president accepted his primary role of leading a government that fulfills the constitutional goal of establishing a just and humane Filipino society. Since he apparently rejects the humane treatment of criminal suspects, dissenters, and the poor, and since his government actively exploits the law to promote injustice, then, by refusing to tax him on his sworn duty to promote just justice, these sectors actually abet the continued desecration and demolition of institutions of justice and accountability. Institutions such as the judiciary, the prosecution and law enforcement services, the legal profession, the ombudsman, the commission on human rights, civil society, and the press. Excuse me, we five as a minutes. nation, we as a nation must return to the good and stop this worship of power and the strong man immediately. We must all, privately and publicly, confront the president with how he is denying the young the possibility of belonging to a nation that is respected because it values the life of its people, because it understands right from wrong, and because it always chooses of justice over politics. Everyone in government must start a discussion on where they have depart from, departed from legal, moral, and professional ethical norms. They must dig deep into their souls to discover how they have so allowed the destruction of values that once defined and unified us as a nation. The good elements among them must find their voice again. This is especially important for actors in the justice sector. Each of them must be just. They must demonstrate justice not only in the ordinary cases, they must be just even in the cases where political pressure is strongest. Those of us in the academe have a special task to get rid of our ivory tower notions of our own correctness and join the people on the ground, helping them understand how institutions of justice designed to protect them must remain strong and independent. I am making a special call to the youth to reach out to your parents, to your elders, relatives, and government and officials. Tell them they have a special burden not to mortgage your future. Amidst tangled thoughts and emotions, despite society's angry and confused tone, seize on one truth and let it come forth clearly. Right is right, no matter the time or season, no matter the numbers. And this season becomes you, the young, who understand trolls and memes and fake news, who goods and pegs. You, more than us, know how many of you are disconnected and the injustice, irrationality, and the near insanity being foisted on our people. Write poems, sing, animate cartoons, launch flash mobs, communicate in every way you know that you have had enough of injustice, corruption, untruth, and irrationality. For a start, urgent attention must be given to a situation that requires all our concerted action. Our foreign and domestic policies have yielded to a Manchurian policy of preferring the interests of China over that of the Philippines and Filipinos. No logic, no historical reason, no in economic imperatives are given, yet China, above all, has been favored. We must loudly, with megaphone magnitude, protest this most grievous injustice. And this is where amplification by voices of the young will seriously matter. We must create a united force for good and invite 
our president to join us. He must abandon the call to kill, kill, and kill. Instead, as an officer of the law and a servant of the people, he must lead a discussion on the roots of injustice and how we can strengthen the institution, the Constitution, and not weaken it. I did not discuss the technical aspects of lawfare to prevent lawyers from dominating the discussion. The reinstatement of the rule of law can only occur if people are no longer cowed by legalities and instead insist on justice. Any meaningful reform of this nation in aid of justice must be led by young people, the widows and orphans, by ordinary people whose hunger for truth and justice overcomes legal obscurantism. What is just is not necessarily what the courts pronounce as legal. And just a very small uh, personal sharing. As I end this talk, allow me to share with you how I know God to be so you will understand where I'm coming from. I have been attacked for talking about God in a personal way. But I know no stronger foundation to fight for justice and what for what is right than to believe that through it all, God is with me, Emmanuel. The God of justice and love has enabled me to see that to defend the right of the poor to their lives and to their innocence was more important than to compromise and save my title. The God of justice fills my heart and enables me to be content and at peace. I know from his word that the world flowing with his justice and love is what he desires. And it is my bounden duty to call on my fellow men to fight for a country filled with justice. I live. Thank you very much. I live with a final invitation. Can we continue with this national conversation? Can we all come together and tell ourselves, our country, and the president that this is what is good? And it is our duty, every one of us, to fight for what is good. We will resist evil, no matter where it takes us. God bless you all.